I want to welcome everyone back to the Picanetto Show. Returning, going to do a little bit more of this World War One series. How are you doing today, Thomas? I'm a little bit under the weather, so like I indicated before we went live, if it seems like I'm experiencing brain fog or something, it's not because I've got early onset Alzheimer's or something. No problem. Just be aware of that. Um, I want to talk about the American internal situation. Not just the Wilson administration and the intrigues therein, which were substantial, you know, particularly involving the personage of Colonel House. Wilson himself is really kind of unfairly maligned by everybody. Like people on our side, and I'm not going to speak for you, people are like adjacent to like my belief structure. They view him as the father of, you know, utopian progressivism and globalism. I don't think that's true. Okay. Um, people on the people on the left hate him because, you know, they view him as this big kind of racialist on grounds of, you know, the fact that he he very much pandered in some sense to the to nativist elements, you know, who were gaining a lot of clout in terms of their ability to mobilize you know, and get people to the polls and things. You know, Wilson was the only, he was a university professor. You know, that was, that was literally like his his vocation. You know, um, and uh, a man like that, unless he was very much insulated from people who saw fit to sort of manipulate his lack of experience in delegating authority in the way that such things are done in Washington, you know, any man who did not have the advantage of such things was going to be misled in key capacities. And I think some of that is the case with Wilson. And finally, people forget, you know, Wilson's 14 points were actually, I mean, unrealistic as they may have been, they were premised on a commitment to not punishing Germany and not punishing the constituent elements of the Hapsburg Empire. And not, you know, assigning war guilt. You know, Wilson was disgusted when it became clear that, you know, both Paris and London essentially wanted to pick the bones of a permanently prostrate Germany and, you know, divide up the world between each other because suddenly, you know, formerly Ottoman dominions and German holdings in Africa and Asia were up for grabs. So it was, you know, he... And Wilson, I think the war killed him. Wilson died shortly after. You know, he felt like he'd been made a fool of. Um, for and he he took, unlike a lot of modern executives, he took responsibility for the American war dead, which were substantial. Okay, I and mean, it was horrible. And I, mean, I don't I don't want to turn this episode and next episode, which we're going to deal with America. I don't want to turn this into some hagiography of Wilson. Okay, I'm not saying Wilson was a good president. But the situation is more complicated than people will allow. And but today, I don't want to get some I don't want to get into the character of Wilson today. We'll do that next time. And we may go for a third episode unless people are figuring out World War One. So I want to deal with the battlefield situation and the American Expeditionary Force, which is a fascinating topic. And it's very important because that that was the game changer in battlefield terms of the Bolshevik Revolution. <coughs> But the key, the key to understanding why America became involved in World War I, as I've indicated before in our discussion, it's one of the rare instances where high finance can be said to have had a dispositive impact on the decision to go to war. I find it incredibly irritating. I call it the alibi of the simpleton when people... There's a, the fools, half-educated fools who invoke Smedley Butler quotes and say war is about bankers and banking. And that's, a, that's the alibi by the simpleton. It's really, really annoying and really, really just misguided. However, J.P. Morgan and some other concerns quite literally were bankrolling London's war effort. And based upon what they were being told from the onset of hostilities, until, you know, until about mid-1915, when it became clear that a real quagmire was emergent. Like, they were being told that this war would resolve within months. And Allied victory was basically guaranteed. 
And one of the ways the Crown was able to sell that narrative is because that's basically what that's basically what military authorities outside of Germany, interestingly, were saying. Okay, this is something of a consensus. That doesn't mean it's okay to gamble on the outcome of a war with uh, with America's America's financial system, but I mean, um, the degree to which the, the degree of the decision to go to war was in part a bailout of Wall Street. Like that is true. That's the one instance of the 20th century that's true. But the other part of that, um, <clears throat> the other part of that equation has to do with the situation in in like the internal situation in America and these intrigues, specifically between America and Mexico, which is why the Zimmerman telegram was a big deal. For those that don't know, I'll explain what the Zimmerman telegram is in a minute. But first I want to say it's cast by a lot of historians, both revisionists and court historians alike, that the Zimmerman telegram was somewhat pretextual as it causes belly. Or that it was like, or that it was like the... Um, the communique issued by Wilhelm to Paul Kruger congratulating him on, you know, taking on, on waging his guerrilla campaign against the British crown. Okay. It was a lot more significant than that. It wasn't a matter of pride or clout or of Washington DC, not wanting to abide insults from what they viewed as a belligerent foreign power. America and Mexico, for all practical purposes, were at war, okay, from definitely from 1910 until the early 1920s, and arguably from the time of the Spanish-American, from the close of the Spanish-American War in, in, until about 1930. You know, this idea that, this idea that Mexico was just kind of this, like, troubled backwards state, but it's a benign place, that's not true at all. And um, Pershing, obviously, who... I think Pershing is a probably the greatest American military commander who ever lived. And uh, he was a logistics genius. And the interstate highway system was something that he designed. And Eisenhower, who's his protege, was able to implement in policy terms as well as, you know, corralling the, the engineers and, and uh, capital to make it happen. But, you know, Pershing, uh, Pershing's most prestigious command before the Great War was the Pancho Villa expedition. And that was considered a big deal. It was uh, it was viewed as, in, you know, as essential to American national security to bring the border situation uh, under control. You know, it's, I mean, it, which, which is fascinating, or it should be. You know, the more things change, the more they stay the same. And that's that's something I point out to people I mean, I, I, some years back now. Trump didn't articulate his position well, but when Trump was talking about the situation on the border, like nothing's really changed. Like this idea, like oh, Trump's saying mean things about Mexicans or 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 uh, or, uh, or Spanish Americans or whatever, or Latinos, whatever. Um, that's not really the way to interpret it. Like however you feel about Trump, whatever you feel about the situation to the south. Um, it, it's it's an ongoing national security quagmire, okay? And it, immigration is part of that, but it's structural and political as well. And uh, conceptually, people seem to have a blind spot there. People who live in the Southwest certainly don't. But I think people who aren't proximate to the situation, odd as that might seem, considering that the world's being kind of one place because of, you know, the availability availability of up to the minute situational awareness. Nevertheless, you know, it's not something people really think about. And, you know, the, uh, the situation with the, with the Sinaloa cartel and whatever is going to replace it. And I think something is in the process of replacing it. Uh, I mean, that, that's a national security matter too. It's not, it's not just because people getting addicted to addicted to narcotics is bad. It's uh, you're, you're talking about you're talking about a hostile non-state actor, you know, based in Mexico that essentially can bring to bear the the hard power of of, of many states, you know, um, that is a law unto itself and in, in huge swaths of territory adjacent to 
the continental United States. Any, anybody talking about it like it's a law enforcement problem or just an immigration problem that's horribly misguided, but bring it back to where we need to be. Wilson's declaration of war, Wilson, when he, he, when he asked Congress for a declaration of war against the German Empire, He addressed Congress on on April second, nineteen seventeen, and he he resoundingly was he was he, 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 a resounding yes. There was a partisan divide. Gave him a war mandate. Now this is interesting, okay? Because the Lusitania, which was almost two years previous, when Lusitania was sank, there were people. Um, it was a substantial minority of. Of uh, of people who uh, who were clamoring for a war declaration, then, um, you know it, uh, and and will I mean it wasn't just because Wilson campaigned on um, literally on a platform of of keeping America out of out of a European war, but and it wasn't either just that the Lusitania was um, what was in fact carrying arms, and I mean this this was this was scandalous, not just because. It placed people's lives in danger at scale, you know, without their knowledge of it, you know, and c- civilians at that, you know, including women and children. But um, it, it would have compromised kind of America's entire claim to moral credibility with respect to the combatant states, you know, not just it's, you know, kind of like nominal allies at that time in the in the Entente, but contra the contra the. Um, you know, the Habsburgs, Habsburg Empire, you know, Germany and, and the Ottomans. But, um, what, uh, you know, as we talked about before, too, I think we mentioned it in the context of Nixon's, um, 1968 election. Um, Wilson, in Wilson's first term, he did not have a particularly strong mandate. You know, he'd run against, uh, he'd, um, it had been a four way uh, contest, you know, and that like Theodore Roosevelt um, ran as a, an independent. There's a socialist candidate whose name eludes me. And again, forgive me for being kind of foggy. And there was um, the incumbent William Howard Taft. Um, so there was always kind of a Wilson in the commander in chief role was not particularly strongly situated. <clears throat> so if he was just going to go, if he was, if he was just mining for some kind of clout or if he was looking for a way to kind of insinuate himself as an article two warlord, he had plenty of opportunities to do it. Okay. He didn't, he didn't need to rely on the Zimmerman telegram as, as some kind of pretext or as some kind of, as some kind of Gulf of Tonkin raison d'etre, if you want to look at it that way. Okay. This was genuinely impactful. Um, now, the immediate catalyst or the proximate catalyst, the German high command had announced on February 1st, 1917, it would, it would resume unrestricted submarine warfare in the North Atlantic and in the ports uh, and in enemy ports in the, in the Mediterranean, and as well as territorial waters and contiguous zones. The rationale for this being what I just said, you know, they said, look, like, you know, you're, you're, you're loading, you're, you're loading civilian vessels with arms, you know, um, and uh, that, that means that everything is a target. And, uh, is that legitimate? Yeah, I think so. But that was the, um, that was the, uh, that's what Wilson designated as, uh, the immediate catalyst. But, um, he'd broken off diplomatic relations with, uh, Berlin upon discovery of the Zimmerman telegram. And I think that that's kind of like the key to this entire. That's the key to this entire um, kind of nexus of causation. <clears throat> the 
the uh, most diplomats initially believed the Zimmerman telegram was some kind of forgery. Um, by uh, you know the the proverbial war party in America, but it wasn't, and it became clear it wasn't because the Kaiser's representatives admitted every word of it was accurate. And that it had, and that what what it had been reported over the international newswire was a word for word translation. Now the message itself, um, it was dispatched on January seventeenth, nineteen seventeen. It came in the form of a coded telegram that was dispatched personally by Arthur Zimmerman, the staat secretar. Um, in the foreign office, uh, he was second only to the foreign minister. Okay. Um, the message was conveyed to the German ambassador to Mexico, Heinrich von Eckert. Zerman sent the telegram in anticipation of the resumption of unrestricted submarine warfare by Germany, obviously. So, I mean, that, that can raise the question as to whether it was presumed that America would simply issue a war declaration in the wake of that, I mean, that's an inter interesting question on its own right, but um, there's indications that the, the the Imperial, the German Imperial Navy seemed to believe it was a foregone conclusion, you know, that that a, a declaration from the Wells administration was imminent, a declaration of war. But um, what the telegram instructed, it instructed Eckhart that if the United States appeared certain, you know, to, to, to enter the war. Um, he was to approach the Mexican government with a proposal for military alliance and Germany would essentially fund the efforts. Now, mind you, again, this, this was a situation where America and Mexico were already in like a low intensity conflict, you know? Um, so this was not like a boat from the blue. Um, suggestion or something that you know was out with or something that suggested like a change in the status of relations or something. Uh, it, it represented a willingness to drastically escalate an already like an extant condition of hostilities, but I think that I think that that's important. Um, the language of the telegram as follows was quote. We intend to begin on the 1st of February unrestricted submarine warfare. We shall endeavor in spite of this to keep the United States of America neutral. In the event of this not succeeding, we make Mexico a proposal of alliance on the following basis. Make war together, make peace together. Generous financial support and an understanding on our part that Mexico is to reconquer the lost territory in Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona. The settlement in detail is left to you. You will inform the president of the above most secretly as soon as the outbreak of war with the United States of America is certain. And I had the suggestion that he should, on his own initiative, invite Japan to immediate adherence and at the same time mediate between Japan and ourselves. Please call the president's attention to the fact that the ruthless employment of our submarines now offers a prospect of compelling England in a few months to make peace. Signed, Zimmerman. Now, the Mexican border war, just to put it in context, it was the last, it was the last true war fought on American soil. Its predecessors obviously being the Revolutionary War, the War of 1812, the Mexican War, and the war between the states. Um, the Indian Wars were an ongoing ethnic conflict, obviously, that, in my opinion, didn't resolve until 1920. But that was distinguishable from, you know, well, Westphalian War between state actors. So, I mean, the fact that, I mean, regardless of the regardless of the relative power of Mexican forces and being or Mexican mobilization potential across the United States, like regardless of that, um, 
it, it was it was tying America down in theater and it was waging war on America on American soil in part. I mean, this was a serious matter, you know, um, and particularly from the beginning of the Mexican Revolution in 1910, the U.S. Army was stationed in relative depth along the border and on several occasions engaged uh, the Mexican Army. <laughs> um, the height of this came in 1916 when Pancho Villa attacked the, the border town of Columbus, New Mexico. And uh, in response was the Pancho Villa expedition under command of Pershing into northern Mexico. You know, the 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 mission objective of which was to was to uh was to was to find and capture or kill Pancho Villa. And although it was not captured, the expeditionary force did locate him. It in, it in, it in uh it engaged the the rebels under his command and it killed a couple of his top officers. Via himself escaped. The American Army returned to the United States in January 1917, among other reasons, because it became clear that they were going to have to deploy to Europe and like everything was changing. But um, Pancho Villa at this point had become like a national hero. And like a lot of Mexicans were like looking to join a revolutionary cause against the gringo because they viewed it as like this big victory. They're like, hey. You know, we we ran a raid into, you know, into New Mexico and we, you know, and, and we terrorized America in its own backyard, you know, and then we fought off the U.S. Army when it when it, you know, when it when it tried to chase down, when it tried to chase down Pancho Villa, you know, so, I mean, they we, we can't be stopped, you know, on our own turf. And the, I mean, this kind of this kind of nonsense. But uh, so, I mean, obviously, the Germans are thinking seriously you know, if uh, the, it, it does, it does beg the question: Did the Kaiser and or Holweg and or von Moltke, I mean, whoever was actually reviewing the strategic situation in terms of the hard variables, did he or they think that Mexico had the forces and being, the gumption, the political will, the organizational? um kind of ability to to truly um like recapture what had been lost in the 1846 1848 war i don't know if they did or not but just the very fact that mexico was in a position to mount such an expedition even if it was a disaster i mean that would america would have to prioritize that theater over any overseas deployment you know um and forcing america into a two front war in the Southwest, like as they're taking mass casualties in Europe, I mean, that's, that would be a problem, you know? Um, and even uh, really all Germany had to do was tie America down enough so that it was incapable of stopping what became the 19th, the, the spring offensive. Okay. We'll get into that next episode. But, um, you know, even after, even after um even after the american withdrawal in 1917 conflict on the border continued you know the us army continued to launch smaller operations in the mexican territory like we think what we think of now was like almost like search and destroy missions that kind of like went on in vietnam you know like chasing down guerrillas chasing down rebels who were raiding border territories you know things like that um trying to identify you know, f friendly, um, friendly non-combatants, you know, among whom they've been moving and had been, you know, storing like foodstuffs and weapons and ammunition for them. I mean, this was a dirty war, you know. Um, now, what was a game changer here and uh, was one of the things that I believe um, was strongly catalyzing in terms of America and Wilson specifically, um, getting a really strong mandate 
because initially there was a Wilson had a strong mandate to go wage World War One. When you know, and he got a standing ovation in in Congress when he issued his speech. When only months before, like basically the country was totally opposed to intervention, and nobody can really explain why this is, but I think it comes down to what I'm about to describe. The uh, the battles of Ambos Nogales. Um, the 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 final conflict over Ambos Nogales was in August 1918. It led to a literal border wall um, between the two towns. It's one of those towns where, like, it's situated. There's one on you know the Mexican side of the border, one on the American side of the border. They both share a name. There's literally like a wall that was erected, you know, between them. So this idea that like there's never been like a border wall or whatever, there's lots of border walls along the Mexican American border. Mexican American border is freaking huge. Okay. But um there are these periodic uh there are these periodic um you know raids on the Mexican side into American territory. And reports emerged uh from the US Army. Not not just from, you know, not from Colonel House uh, in the White House, you know, not from, you know, some newswire service, you know, not from the, some, some British newspaper, but from men in theater that these Mexicans are being led by German officers. OK. And uh, at that point. People who otherwise were reasonable. I think uh, kind of took leave of reason and said we are under attack by Germany. Um, there's some dispute as to who these guys were. Like, were these guys just like European mercenaries? Um, yeah, that's possible. But I mean, I don't, I, you know, it, in, in, in context, I don't really see who else they would have been, you know? Um, and frankly, the Zimmerman telegram would have been kind of meaningless absent the presence of at least, you know, an advisory core on the ground. Um, representing the Kaiser's army. Okay. Um, so, not just the prospect of, but possibly, you know, the emergence uh, through late 1917 into summer 1918 the emergence of an actual hot border war between um, the United States Army and uh, a revolutionary Mexican army, in part at least led by German officers, this this was a game changer, okay? Um, I think in an ongoing capacity. But uh, this was also what came to be known as the border wars, pretty much like after, you know, the, the Pancho V expedition and basically everything... All, all these border conflicts between the United States and Mexico that ensued after 1910. They became in the time and in like you know, really until like the 50s, they were known as the border wars. This was really the catalyst for for shutting down immigration. Okay, I mean, yeah, a lot of it was uh like northern Nat- part of it was you know the coalition that um created kind of the 1920s clan of uh you know Protestant Northerners. You know who, who who viewed the cities as you know being overwhelmed by by Catholics who were creating these political machines and 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 dispossessing them. Yeah, that was a big that that was an ongoing thing, and and that very much ossified um, by 1924. But nationwide, um, the border wars really were kind of what motivated people to go to the poll and say like enough is enough, like shut this down like our where this is a grave like national security threat like these people are hostiles these people being you know like mexicans they're you know we're at war with these people periodically like why the hell are we like allowing them just kind of you know come and go as they please as if as if they were friendlies or you know um or or, or just some kind of like contiguous uh polity or something you know that maintain good offices with us um the uh and it's also the um another aspect of the border wars it uh mexico either mex whether mexico itself was providing 
um, particularly uh, small arms ammunition. Because art artillery was basically exclusively manufactured in Europe. Because, they, I mean, that's a whole different matter. Like, if you're, you're uh, like, you're, you're, if your artillery pieces are going to fire or not, you know, not, it's not a question of quality, but also, like, you know, it, you can't just, you can't, you can't just mock up an artillery shell that's, like, basically, <laughs> it's, it's, like, that's, like, basically compliant with, with caliber and, and things, you know, but it, but, um, Small arms, small arms, ammunitions. Um, there's a huge amount uh, flowing from Veracruz to Germany, <coughs> and uh, that was uh, America. The U.S. Army occupied Veracruz early on um, during one of the anti-rebel expeditions south of the border in 1914. So I mean the uh, this is the context of the Zimmerman telegram. So I think people think of it as like, why the hell was Berlin talking to the Mexicans anyway? And this doesn't make any sense. And like on its face, it doesn't. But if you account for the fact that America was basically at war with Mexico, I mean that that's it, it does make sense. And uh, you know, like I said, this is relevant today in a way that a lot of stuff we talk about isn't. I mean, it's all relevant in terms of meta history and you know psychologically how narratives are structured and things and as well as understanding you know kind of like where we're going like as a people like our people but just you know humans generally kind of like what their fortunes are in in kind of the cycles of of historical development but in kind of brass tacks policy terms like what what was going on literally a hundred years ago on the border is still going on today just with uh you know um a slightly different configuration of uh of opposing forces and you know the added uh the added kind of horror of uh of of the narcotics trade and, and other things. You know, this is not there's nothing new. You know, this is arguably it's it's kind of like the permanent, you know, national security crisis in America is the Mexican border. You know, it's not um that's one of the reasons why it's so like bitch made and basic when fools like, oh that's racism and you don't like Mexicans. Like it I mean, that's like, that's like, that's like fucking, I, I don't even know what to say about that. I mean, I mean, like maybe even if like everybody in America, like hated Mexicans, like, which I certainly don't think is the case, but like, even were that the case, that's not, that's, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the crisis of the border. You know, I mean, it's, um, I mean, like nobody really likes each other. Okay. Like, a, <laughs> frankly, across, across some, um, you know, lines of, uh, um, race and culture okay with with i mean at a, a, a macro scale i mean but um but that's yeah that's uh that's what um that's kind of what i wanted to uh that's kind of what i wanted to cover today and like again i like i said i'm sorry for making this kind of brief and uh i'm sorry for being kind of like foggy in the mind like it's uh this week's been kind of uh this week's been kind of rough so um no, yeah. it's, I no, think it's I'm gonna wrap it up if that's okay with you. And I'll pro I promise, yeah. Um, yeah, I promise, uh, I'll uh, I'll, I'll bring more to bear like when we record again in a few days. Yeah, no problem at all, man. Um, Not just do, it. do some quick plugs and we'll get out of here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, people have been very generous in helping me out. Um, I put out a call for uh, help with some of my production expenses as well as like human talent to help me with like editing and stuff and like a whole bunch of people like there's like a deluge of people like helping with both like that's that that's incredible i've got huge love for you people that's fantastic man but that that's not just a great relief to me man but it means like my workflow is actually coming together i will be dropping fresh shit i've been trying to do as much as i can with 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 people who just like invite me onto their pod because I realize like I'm not dropping fresh shit on my own and that's not a good thing. But I uh I I'm getting on top of it. I season two of the pod is gonna launch. My long form manuscripts are gonna get done. My video content is going to appear. Thank you for bearing with me. I'm sure I sound like a fucking senile person or something, and I'm always like saying this and then like it doesn't emerge, but you can find my uh, pod and other good stuff at my Substack. It's realthomas777.substack.com. 
Find me on X, real capital R E A L underscore number seven H O M A S seven seven seven. Find me at my website number seven H O M A S seven 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 dot com. And uh, yeah, that's about uh, that's about all I got for now. All right, I know the next one's going to be great. We already talked we talked about it previous, so um... yeah, yeah. Yeah, get ready for that one and we'll get it out. We'll try to get it out next week. All right. Yeah, that'd be great, man. All right. Thanks, Thomas. Take care now. Yeah. Thank you, buddy.